Can you hear me in the back okay? Yep. All right. Awesome. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for hanging in here till the end. I'm the only thing between you and a drink right now, and I'm very aware of that. Uh, and thank you also for adventuring your way down to the basement. This is a bit of an odd room. I wasn't sure if anyone would show up given the date and the weirdness of the space, but thank you for coming. I'm Sarah May. I am the chief consultant at DevMind. I'm also the founder of RailsBridge and a director of Ruby Central. I live here. This picture was taken reasonably close to my apartment in the city, um, which looks really awesome until you realize that the other 364 days of the year, a picture taken from that spot looks like this. <laughs> so that was our one nice day. Thank you very much. I'm a developer. I do a lot of Ruby and JavaScript. I tend to work with teams that are managing large code bases uh, that have become unwieldy and hard to change. Sorry, there we go. Uh, this is a common problem right now among all types of developers. I hear it from the Ruby and JavaScript folks, but I've also heard it from the .NET people and the Java people and the PHP people and the CSS people and the Python people. It's not a new problem in our industry, necessarily. IBM was having this problem in the 70s. There's lots of vaguely amusing uh, ad academic literature you can read about that. But it's interesting that this is, again, at the forefront of our collective consciousness right now. So one theory is that code is easier to write than it used to be. Right? There was an explosion of dynamic languages in the last 10 years, but also new frameworks like compiled languages, uh, usable functional languages. All of this has made it easier to generate code at volume. You can achieve a large, unwieldy code base faster than ever before. And perhaps even when you're a small company. Right? You don't have to be the size of IBM to have IBM's problems. And a big, unwieldy code base that's hard to change doesn't necessarily mean that the team's failed at planning. Right? Code that's hard to change is built up technical debt, meaning they took faster feature development today at the expense of code that's harder to work with later. And some teams make that gamble deliberately as a strategy to move faster, particularly in the early days of a company. Competitors that put structures in place to support a large code base in the future couldn't iterate as quickly. So sometimes, technical debt buys your continued existence as a company. And sometimes not planning ahead is the only way to survive long enough to wish you had. So we should all be so lucky to have these problems. But once you've survived, then you have to do something. Because working in these code bases really isn't a whole lot of fun. The vast majority of developers, though, do work in code bases like this. We're not creating new repos all the time. We're working in code bases that have been around for a while. And we need to make working in these fun, if possible. So some teams attempt this maneuver with microservices. You may have heard that buzzword. And that rant is another talk entirely. Uh, but I had to put it in two slides. I will say one thing, which is that a lot of people that do microservices end up with something like this. This is Aaron Patterson. He is a uh, core contributor to Rails and Ruby. And he says, to be honest, the main reason I like microservices is that I feel like my method calls are too fast, and I would prefer to throw in some latency. Turns out, carving services out of a monolith and carving objects out of a large class are the same skill. And if you haven't been doing good object design in your main code base, then you don't know yet what large scale abstractions you need. You have a guess, but you'll be wrong. That's part of the deal. When you're wrong inside of a single code base, all you have to do is adjust object boundaries. When you're wrong in a services cluster, you have to adjust service boundaries, which is a much more expensive way to learn this skill. So before making microservices or doing a rewrite, you have to get better at object-oriented design. And I don't mean the top-down, figuring out everything in advance type design. Anyone can draw one of those diagrams, and it's usually a waste of time. Instead, you need to learn how to refactor your way into good design. And if you don't develop that skill, you'll just end up with the same mess you had before in different packaging. So Aaron, the previous tweet is actually serious, well, as serious as Aaron ever gets, but this is a joke, a joke account um, that nevertheless tweets things that are often more useful than actual thought leaders. So refactoring your way to good design is not as shiny as doing microservices, but from a cost perspective, it's much more responsible. Plus, you can still use find and replace. 
super awesome. So co not coincidentally, I suppose, we've been seeing a resurgence of interest in object-oriented programming design in communities that weren't that interested a few years ago, including the dynamic language communities. There's now lots of books, blog posts, conference talks, like this one about software design. This is the best of the modern takes on object design. Sandy Metz wrote this fantastic book uh, on understanding objects that I highly recommend you read, even if you're not a Ruby developer and do not intend to be. I love this book and all the blog posts and all the conference talks. But for a long time, I thought about a problem, which is that what I do in my client work doesn't really look like anything in here. Sandy's book uses example code being written from scratch to show you how to put the right boundaries around your objects. And going into a big, large, monolithic, messy code base where no one heeded Sandy's advice and moving things around doesn't seem a lot like that at first. It doesn't seem like object-oriented design. For a long time, I called it refactoring. Turns out, though, software design and refactoring are not separate ideas. So I know it seems a little odd. Let's define some terms, starting with software design. Now, I'm not talking about architecture or systems, just within a single code base. Software design is really nothing more than deciding how code is arranged. Many people think that software design is something completely separate from programming. But in reality, when you're programming, even if you're not consciously making any decisions, you're still doing design. Every time you put a function in this object and not that one, you're doing design. You can try to do it ahead of time, some people do, but the vast majority of software design that's done by developers in our industry is in line. And just like programming, you'll be bad at it at first. But just like programming, you get better at software design the more you practice. So let's be a little more specific and talk about object-oriented design, <laughs> which is, I'm gonna give you a somewhat unsatisfying answer, it is deciding how the code will be arranged, grouping related functionality in objects. This does not sound anything like the Wikipedia definition of object-oriented design, which is this. Planning a system of interacting objects for the purpose of solving a software problem. There's nothing in my definition about planning. And that's on purpose. I don't think of software design as a planning activity. It's something we do in line in the process of programming. Now, this is not, as you might have guessed, a common definition of object-oriented design. But it's the difference between how it's taught, especially in academia, and how it actually works on the ground. So let's talk a little bit about what object-oriented design is not. Object-oriented design is not a language feature. It's a way of thinking. You can write object-oriented code in CSS. You can write it in C, or in JavaScript, or in Java, or in C Sharp. Languages that have explicit syntax support for objects are what you'll hear people call object-oriented languages. But this just means languages in which it is more convenient to make objects than other languages. Uh, but that's too long for a Wikipedia page title. So object-oriented languages it is. Object-oriented design is a way of thinking about code arrangement. In some languages, it's easier to express than others, but it's possible anywhere. You can buy me a beer and ask me about object design in Haskell sometime. Object-oriented code is not a destination. It is a means to an end. You don't write object-oriented code for its own sake or because it's somehow morally or professionally better. Object-oriented design is not inherently better than any other way of arranging code. It is a means, a strategy, that we use mindfully to move us towards some larger goal. And for most of us, that goal is ease of change. We build software for people who don't really know what they want. They imagine one thing, then they change their mind when they actually see it in action. Or the business shifts focus, or a key person is replaced, or it's Tuesday, right? The only constant in software development is that the end goal shifts as we build it. And it wouldn't do us any good to wait because the act of building is what causes it to shift. And in theory, object-oriented design makes it easier to respond to shifting requirements. And I can say that, Sandy can say that. But I've been on projects, and I'll bet most of you in this room have been on projects, where code was parceled out into objects and it made it harder to understand rather than easier. How does that happen? Does that mean the entire concept of object-oriented design is a sham? To figure out how that happens, we need to take a step back and look at our goals that we have when we're designing software. There are two useful axes to consider when we're looking at different ways to design software. On the bottom, we have the cost of understanding the big picture of your code, low or high. How, how hard is it to figure out what's going on? 
And on the side, we have the cost of changing the code, low or high. And every choice about how you arrange code, every choice about software design goes somewhere in one of these quadrants. So let's place a few dots. Let's start with writing long procedures. Someone does a get on slash calendar to see their calendar for the month, and a procedure is executed. A list of instructions determines the date range, fetches events within that range from the data store, draws the right shaped grid, puts the events on the grid, returns the page to the user. It's pretty easy to understand what happens in a procedure. Cost of understanding is low. Everything that happens is right there in an ordered list. And the trade-off in a large project with a lot of long procedures is that the cost of change is high. The biggest devil in a code base like that is duplication, right? which forces you to change multiple places in the code to make a single logical change. So procedures belong up here in the upper left. So some projects have been burned by the high cost of procedures go completely in the other direction. Everything's a tiny object that doesn't do much. When you do that get on slash calendar, a route receiver picks up the call, which then creates a route resolver to look at the URL, figures out that it needs a calendar route resolver, which it gets from the calendar route resolver factory. And then the calendar route resolver looks at what you're requesting, initiates a get calendar index object, which then sends your params to a calendar param manager, and so forth. So the sequence of events isn't written down anywhere in the code. You just have to trace through it to figure out what's going on. Little pieces of functionality are spread across many classes. A system like this is harder to understand than a procedure. The cost of understanding is high. A list of instructions will always be easier to understand than a set of objects. However, once you understand the system, the cost of change is low. Assuming you've got the right abstractions, which is the notion we'll deal with in a moment, it's relatively easy to take, for example, one param manager out and swap it another. So a set of small objects goes down here in the lower right. So let's talk now about code that has both a high cost of understanding and a high cost of change. Worst of both worlds. There are two types of code bases here, both of which are distressingly common. And the first is a code base made up of really big objects. Maybe the framework dictated an initial set of classes and all the behavior just sort of accreted onto them since then. And the huge objects all these seem to be the ones that are core to your application, right? They change with almost every commit. Changes go wrong easily because all that functionality in one place means unintentional interference is almost a given. And the other type of code base you find up here is small objects gone wrong which is what happens when you try to break down a big class or extract procedures, but you don't get the object boundaries quite right. Then it's both hard to understand because it's objects and hard to change, because for one logical change, you still have to make changes in a bunch of different places. So the wrong set of objects really is the worst case scenario. Really big objects are bad, but they're not that bad. The wrong set of objects is worse. So there's two questions here. The first is, how can we get here? Can we get here? Is this the perfect solution that doesn't exist? And the second question is, how do we move our big lumbering code bases out of the upper right and into anywhere else? It doesn't really matter where we go. Any direction will be an improvement from here. But usually when code bases are this size, reducing the cost of change is worth increasing the cost of comprehension. So people want to take it down to a set of small objects. And this is where they start reading about things like solid and design patterns hoping they can figure out how to make this move. So let's look at solid for a moment, and then we'll take a brief look at design patterns. Solid sounds super awesome, right? Who doesn't want solid code? Or to be a solid programmer, right? There are, very, there are many, many object-oriented principles in the world. Academia has been studying object orientation for decades. However, academics tend not to deal in volume of code. So most of the principles are highly academic. In the 90s, Robert Martin took the five principles that seemed to him to be the most relevant to working software developers, and he put them into this acronym. So let's talk about what each letter means. We'll be filling in this chart as we go. We have three columns, name of the principle, summary of what it means, not what it says, but what it means, and then a measure of how useful it will be in everyday development. Start with S, single responsibility principle which is usually stated as a class should have one responsibility. Or to put it another way, one reason to change. This was first articulated by Rebecca Wurfsbrock in the 80s. And it's kind of a fancy way of saying smaller things are easier to understand and harder to mess up than larger ones. As far as utility goes, it's sort of in the middle. 
The difficulty here hinges on the definition of responsibility. If you've got a class that finds users, persists users, validates users, allows access to related objects for users, and contains business logic for users, you could plausibly say it's got one responsibility. It manages the user. However, you could equally plausibly say that all of those things are separate responsibilities that all belong in different classes. And the principle doesn't give you any guidance on this because there is no universal right answer. Sometimes it makes sense to put all that stuff together. Sometimes it doesn't. And that shifts over time, even in the same code base. The answer to every question in software development is it depends. O is for the open-closed principle. This is usually stated as a class should be open to extension but closed to modification. Bertram Meyer came up with this in the 80s. It's a fancy way of saying that editing existing code is more difficult and more error prone than just adding new code. Right? All right, sure. So you should arrange your code base so that you can add new functionality by just writing new code without editing anything you already have. So that sounds great. But it's pretty hard to conceive of how this could happen in a code base of significant size. It's pretty easy to think about how it could happen in sort of a test project, a little bit of an inheritance and magic fairy dust and so on. Uh, but in a code base of significant size, hard to imagine, hard to imagine. Not super practical day to day. L, the Liskov substitution principle. This is probably the most academic of all of the solid principles. It is a, a precise mathematical statement. Here it is. Let theta x be a property provable about objects x of type t then theta y should be true for objects y of type s, where s is a subtype of t. Crystal clear. This is a, a fancy way of saying that anywhere you can use an instance of class foo, you should be able to use an instance of class var that is a subclass of foo. Nothing should go wrong. So the Liskov substitution principle was formulated by Barbara Liskov in the 80s. By the way, when she was in her late 40s, don't ever let anyone tell you you're too old to do something awesome. The Liskov substitution principle basically says inheritance, this is a thing. Seems pretty obvious to us at this point, doesn't it? But when it was first articulated, it wasn't really obvious at all. And it was such a good idea since it, that since it was introduced, we have baked it into our languages. It's part of the air we breathe. We don't notice it anymore. The Liskov substitution principle has had a huge impact on the way we write software, which is, I assume, why Martin chose to include it in solid. Certainly not because he just needed an L. Uh, however, while it's fundamental, it's not really a good source of practical help day to day. Utility is low. Let's look at I. Interface segregation says that classes should only have to depend on the part of an interface they actually need. This makes a lot of sense in compiled languages. Let me show you how. So let's say you've got a class musician that has five methods, record song, edit song, mix song, play set list, and sell merge. So it has two classes that consume it, an album creator and a gig. And these use different sets of methods that are not related to each other. So then you add another method, drive the van, that is only used by gig. And you'd expect at this point, right, that musician and gig have to be recompiled in a compiled language. However, it turns out that all consumers of musician must be recompiled, including album creator, which didn't change at all. So it was just two consumers, who cares, right? But if musician had hundreds of consumers that had to be recompiled every time you made any change, you can see how it's a huge pain. Makes rerunning a test, for one thing, a very long process. To fix this, interface segregation suggests you break musician into two different parts, studio action, venue action, perhaps. And that way, when a new, ad, um, new method's added to venue actions, album creator does not need to be recompiled. So that's cool. Dynamic languages don't really have this problem. The worst that has to happen is a reload, and it's a lot faster than any compilation process would be. However, interface segregation does have one really useful core idea. And that is that if different consumers of a class use non-overlapping sets of methods, that's a sign that the class has multiple responsibilities. Right? Remember in S, we talked about the fact that it's very difficult to tell what granularity you need your responsibilities to be. Here's a clue. So I put its utility high relative to the other principles we've looked at. So finally, D, the dependency inversion principle, not dependency injection although that is one uh, implementation of the principle. So dependency inversion says depend on abstractions rather than concretions, which I'm sure is crystal clear, which is a fancy way of saying if you want to make a new thing, a new instance of something inside of, a, inside of a, another class, you could either just make it there or you could pass it in. And these might not look like they're very different, 
But in the first example, the code has to know the name of the constructor function it wants to call. It has a dependency on that name. And in the second case, it doesn't. You've moved the dependency to the caller, to the creator of a student object. So it has the effect of moving all of your choices about behavior to the edges of your system, which can be very useful. So there's lots of dependency injection frameworks. Angular has one, .NET, Java. They make it easier to test classes. And given that most of them have essentially become gigantic global state, it's sometimes a bit difficult to tie them back to the principle. But dependency inversion does seem to be theoretically something a lot of people see. So all right, utility high. So now that we've filled in our chart, let's look at it for a moment. The solid acronym has principles of vastly varying degrees of utility or concreteness, right? Utility or immediate applicability to code you're writing today is one end of a spectrum. And the opposite end is abstraction, which describes a general rule that sounds like a good idea, but it's hard to connect to code you're looking at in your editor. So O and L are the most abstract, I and D are the most concrete, and S sits in the middle. So we've got at least three different levels of abstraction at work here. And none of them, not even the I or the D, seem actually useful in day-to-day -day operations in refactoring code. I mean, it's nice to say make the API on an object small, but that ship has sailed for most of us. So we need some rules that are a little bit more concrete to guide our everyday work in these code bases. It's not clear how to find them. So a lot of people turn to design patterns. Let's talk about design patterns for a moment. A design pattern is an example set of object boundaries that seems to work well in many situations. I'll give you an example of the pattern called the observer. Let's say you have a user class, and when a new user is created, it automatically sends them an email to get them to confirm their account. Now, normally, this is fine. If your user class is small, your object graph is uncomplicated, fine to leave this here. But a lot of times, the user gets to be one of the biggest classes in the system. And it can be annoying to have it send email every time you want to make one. Because you have to find ways to turn it off when you're creating user in your tests. Every test requires you to create a user. So you want to separate user creation from email sending so that it's easier to turn off. So you create a new class called user observer. Oh, there we go. User observer. And you move the email functionality in there. And you give it a set of creepy googly eyes so that it can observe the user. And now, when a new user is created, the user observer notices, and it sends the email for you. So that's cool, right? You've reduced the size of your user class. You've made it easier to turn off email sending by just deactivating an observer. You've made the code easier to change. But you've also made it hard to understand. You used to only have to look one place to see everything that happened when a user was created. It all happened in the user class. Now you've got two places to look. Because it's in a separate class, other people may not know it exists, let alone that they have to turn it off and then be unpleasantly surprised when the users they create get email. If you start out with a code base here and you apply the observer pattern just like we talked about, you move it down here. That is the confounded face emoji, in case you were wondering. Uh, you've made it easier to change, but you've made it harder to understand. Many people read about design patterns and start looking for opportunities to apply them. They assume that making less structured code into patterns is always a good idea, but it's not. Patterns are not a useful good. Everything has a cost. And that's the hard part, right? At what point does the lower cost of change outweigh the higher cost of understanding? And that, again, is not a question with a single answer. It'll be different at different parts of your code. It'll be different at different times in the same part of your code. So the patterns give us more concrete ideas about how to arrange code, but they don't tell us when to do it. So we're still missing something. We still need one more thing to help us figure out what to do. Like when we sit down at a code base and we're trying to work on a feature, what do we do to make it better? So here's an idea that might be useful. Strategy and tactics are military concepts. I didn't grow up in a military family, so for a long time, I pretty much thought of these words as being the same thing, but they're not. A strategy is a high-level objective that will move us closer to some goal. A tactic is something you do on the ground to achieve that strategy. So let me give you an example of how these are different. Your goal is to be a pro mountaineer. Your strategy is to climb this mountain that not very many people have climbed before, and you're starting from the bottom, and you need to make it up to the top. So there's no trails. You need to figure your own way up. The strategy 
is where you want to be at the end of the day, on top of the mountain, and your tactics are how you get there. Tactics include planned route, contingency plans, and your tactics are guided by and maybe changed by the strategy as you walk up the mountain. So possible routes include walking along the tree line and going up the right-hand ridge, climbing this rock face, and then going up the left-hand ridge. There's, you know, just straight going for it. That works too. Uh, they all involve different tactics, right? Walking versus climbing versus rappelling. And the actual route you take will depend on the weather, your skills, your gear, and many other things. Once you do choose a route, it's probably still not what's going to actually happen. You get to the base of the ridge, you discover the avalanche has made it too perilous to go up that way. So you change tactics, because your strategy of climbing the mountain is no longer in line with your original tactics. So part of your tactics include determining when to change tactics. So what would happen if all we had was a strategy? All we know is, OK, there's a mountain. I need to get to the top of it. If you set out to achieve this strategy without working on any of the little steps you could take to get there, it's not likely to work out for you very well. You may get to the top accidentally, but it's more likely that you'll try a few fruitless paths, find yourself in a valley you can't get out of, and then have to signal the park rangers to airlift you out. So you need to have tactics in mind or you probably won't achieve your strategy. Our actual goal is not being a pro mountaineer, it's changeable code. That's the promise of objects. We want our code to be easy to change. And one way to think about strategies and tactics for changeable code is to say that our strategy is object-oriented design. Our tactics would then be things like solid and patterns. And this is how object-oriented design is taught, particularly in academia. And this is how most developers look at it, whether or not they can articulate that. For most people, solid and patterns are the tactics we use to achieve object-oriented design. Uh, there's a problem, though, with this picture of the world. And that is that object-oriented design isn't actually a strategy. Remember, our strategy describes what we want our world, or in this case, our code base, to look like at the end of the day. And object-oriented design doesn't really do that. On the other hand, solid is reasonably good at describing what our code base should look like when it's finished. Single responsibility principle, for example, would make a great strategy. It describes a state of our code base in which there is one responsibility at the right granularity per class. And if we had that, our code base would be more changeable. And open-close describes this code base utopia where you never have to edit code to add features. In fact, all of these principles are, at some level, descriptions of when you know your code is right or done. If your code were like this, it would be more changeable. So solid is a great set of strategies. Our problem is that we've been trying to use them like tactics. For example, you can't just apply the single responsibility principle directly to a thousand line class. Right? A class like that has a muddy set of abstractions spread across multiple methods each that are hard to distinguish. And when you squint at the class and sort of envision how you'd break it up, you're most likely going to be wrong. The abstractions are hard to see by definition, because if they weren't, you'd have done something about it already. So trying to eyeball a large class and sort of see what the right abstractions are is like trying to head towards a summit without planning a route ahead of time. But we do this a lot. I've been on many teams where some class, some object gets too big, too frustrating to work with, so we'd schedule a week to refactor it. And we spend that week sort of just eyeballing the class, trying to surface the right abstractions. I think about these as stop the world refactorings. And you shouldn't do them. But what's wrong? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with the stop the world refactoring, right? Refactoring is part of being a good software engineer, right? Taking time to clean up and make the code better is important, right? Two interesting things happen when you stop the world to refactor. And the first one is that the product team is really unhappy. You're taking a whole week off from their perspective, meaning you're not working on anything they can see. And the second thing is, because you're time limited, you feel pressure at the end of the week to break that class up somehow, even if you're not entirely sure yet what the right boundaries are. Now, both of these are bad. Maintaining trust with the product team is one of the most important parts of your job. You can only tell them good software engineering practice so many times before they start wondering why, with all of this good software engineering practice, we aren't getting features done more quickly. And rushing through a refactor is exactly how you end up here. The only way to make a stop the world refactoring work is to not do it. It's like global thermonuclear war, right? The only winning move is not to play. 
When we apply these strategies as though they were tactics, we end up with these ham-handed, mostly unplanned, unpopular changes that just leave us in a worse place than before. We're doing this. It's frustrating. You ever wonder why a lot of good developers who started out in an object-oriented language are turning to functional programming? Certainly novelty is part of it. Uh, but if you read some of the stuff that they write, it's a, there's a strong undercurrent of fundamental criticism of OO, right? They say it just doesn't work. And what they're actually saying is, there's a summit here, and they can see it, and it seems like they should be able to get there, but they can't. So what we're missing is tactics that get us up there in explicit small steps. We need things we can do every day as we're doing feature work to inline that refactoring time and allow the right objects to emerge from the mess over time. Patterns are part of our tactics, but they're not everything we need. Right? Earlier, we talked about the fact that patterns don't tell you when is the right time to apply them. And if we set off with only patterns as our tactics, it's like telling the mountaineer, all right, here's your tactics. You climb an ice wall like this. You scale a cliff like this. Here's how you edge along a shelf. Right? Here's how you scrabble over loose rock. All right, go. Have a good time. And there's a lot of skill involved in climbing an ice wall, but the real skill lies in knowing when to do it and when not to. When you come to the ice wall, should you climb it, or should you look for a way around? So when you see code you could change, should you change it? This is our missing piece. We have solid, we have patterns, and now we need guidelines. So I got six of them for you. I made my own acronym. I figure if it worked for solid, it can work for me. Stable. This mountain is solid, which is cool, but when I'm trying to get up it, what I actually need is stability, right? I want it to, for example, not be a volcano, not avalanche out from under my feet, not drop boulders on me, right? I need it to be solid, sure, uh, but at a more immediate level, when I'm making my, my way on the ground, I need stability. And the same is true of my code base. I want it to conform to all the solid principles. That would be great. However, what I really need is to know that if I make a change in one part of the code, it won't cause an avalanche on the other side of the mountain. So let's go through these tactics. S, smell your code. What this means is to study code smells and other don'ts, right? We've got lots of don'ts. Code smells are a, a list of common problems in code. Uh, Martin Fowler's book, Refactoring, is fabulous for these. Uh, I worked with a team that would pick one code smell each week and spend one lunchtime sort of looking at it and trying to find examples in their code. And the reason you do this is because you want to start noticing and naming the problems in your code, even though you won't be fixing them all yet. T is for tiny problems first. In messy code, there'll be a lot of smells. They'll overlap, they'll intertwine, they'll interfere with each other. It'll be hard to see what you should make with all of this mess. So the best way to get started is to pick a really small problem that you know how to solve in a very concrete way and just fix that. For example, rename a variable whose usage has diverged from its name. Pick the smallest problem to fix, even though you see enough of the bigger problems to start guessing their answers. Your goal is to see the larger problems better by clearing away the small problems that obscure them. The more information you gather about these larger problems, the more likely the eventual abstractions will be right. Proper abstractions are worth waiting for. Let them emerge from the code you have by clearing away the easy cruft. A stands for augment your tests. You will almost certainly have to do this to be able to refactor large classes. You need integration tests one level higher than the class you're working on, and you need these in place before you start doing any of this. Right? So if you were in a server-side MVC application, if you want to refactor a big controller, you'll need view-level integration tests. If you want to refactor a big model, you need controller-level integration tests. Because you want to test behavior rather than implementation. Right? That's why you go one level up. You need tests that describe the behavior you want to keep. And this may mean getting rid of some lower-down unit tests or writing new tests at a level you haven't had them before. B, back up when it's useful. When the code has an abstraction in it that is no longer serving you well, when you have objects that don't seem like they're quite the right thing, sometimes the most useful thing to do is rewind the code, put all that duplication back, make it back into a procedure, and start looking at it again. It is much, much harder to move from a, uh, much easier, rather, to move from a procedure to the right set of objects than it is to move from the wrong set to the right set. So don't get caught by the sunk cost fallacy. Don't forge ahead with a set of objects that don't even fit now, let alone in the future. L is for leave it better than you found it. During any one expedition into the code to add the feature, fix a bug, you won't be able to fix all the problems you see. Can't hug every cat, right? And there is our meme from 2010 for today. 
Sometimes the only thing you can do alongside your stated goal is rename a method so it describes this behavior better, and that action seems really small. And our instinct is to save a bunch of those up and do them once. But don't give in to that stop the world temptation. Fix one thing, the smallest thing, while you're working on a story that concerns that code. I was a Girl Scout back in the day. Uh, one of our rules was when we were out camping that we would always leave a campsite in better shape than when we arrived. And over time, this made a better experience for everyone, including ourselves, so partially selfish. If you change that one method name, you're removing a little piece of cognitive dissonance from your code. The next person to come through this code will be able to understand it a little more easily. Maybe the big abstraction will suddenly be obvious. Or maybe they'll just fix the next smallest thing. The key insight is that little things add up over time. Finally, E, expect good reasons. Assume past developers had good reasons to write the code they did. Some code looks ho so horrible, and I think, what idiot wrote this? Why would anyone ever do it this way? And then I run git blame and find out it was me six months ago or it was one of the developers I really admire, right? There are forces at work on the code beyond developer experience and skill. Deadlines, relationships with other groups like product, QA operations, company financial situation, all of these and many others leave their fingerprints on the code base. So if you start thinking about the social pressures that affect your code base, many other things will make a lot more sense. So here we go. These are tiny things you can do to inline refactor large classes as you're making progress on features. You don't have to stop the world. You can rebuild trust with your product team, and as a bonus, you're much more likely to end up with the, the abstractions that you want. Now, this is a cycle, right? It's some, not something you do once. You keep fixing the small problems, and the solutions to the large ones become obvious. So now that we've got our, our how, our patterns, right? And we've got our when, which is our stable. Oh, there we go. I did this in the wrong order. And we've got our what, which is solid, and we've got our why, which is our changeable code, and all we're missing is who. And the answer is everybody. Everyone on your team should be doing this. And you might ask, don't you still have to say it, stop the world sometimes? Oh no, now I have to go through them again. It's all right, I like that transition. I'll be zoom. All right. Uh, don't you still have to stop the world sometimes? Because after all, once you've cleaned up enough of the small problems to see a solution to a larger problem, you still do actually have to solve the larger problem. Uh, Kent Beck has a really interesting way of talking about this. For each desired change, make the change easy. Warning, this may be hard. Then make the easy change. When you remove the small problems, the big problems become obvious and they become much easier because you've amortized the cost spent fixing the big problems and as a result, you end up with a higher quality solution that when you see it will look in retrospect really, really obvious. Kent's warning is important here though, this may be hard. The stable cycle won't always prevent you from extracting the wrong objects or trying a fix that doesn't work. You'll still have to go down some paths that lead to dead ends, but on this process, that's expected. Back up and try another, and that's why backup is one of the essential steps in this process. But this time we aren't just wandering aimlessly like we were back here. We're moving tactically. We're following steps that we know will get us there. Even if the final shape of the journey doesn't look anything like we, what we thought it would when we started. Work on making your code stable and it will eventually be solid. You can get to the top. You can be the success story. Just make sure you head up with a plan. Thank you very much.